I'm Jen Jordan, by the way. Um, I am a former state senator, a Democratic uh, nominee for attorney general, um, but maybe more significantly for purposes of this is that I am a Georgia woman and a mother, um, and I'm not going to leave the state, so we're going to have to do something, right? Um, and I think all of y'all feel the same way. So let's get started since I'm running late. So, Jillian, let's, why did you do this in the first place? Um, well, uh, Roe v. Wade was overturned in June of 2022, um, and I just kept getting like calls from male friends being like, hey, just want to like check in to see if you're okay. And I was like, no, um, <laughs> but thank you for your support. Um, and so I was driving back from Florida to to Atlanta after visiting a friend and I just kind of had the thought of like man what if after like I was by the Florida Georgia line and I just thought what if I couldn't cross the state without having to like pass like a pregnancy test or something and then that just sort of sparked um, the beginning of it all and I wrote the script in like two weeks and then was like cool now what? Um, and I've never made a film before, so it was a giant year-long learning process. Um, and boy, boy, oh boy, did I learn. Um, but it's been incredible, and yeah, that's, that's why I made it. I wanted to spark conversations that um, I felt like we live in a society, especially right now, that is so uh, like polarized that uh, even the topic of abortion has to like, like Right now, for example, I cannot post or boost any post on social media because it's about abortion. So that limits my ability to like spread the message, right? And so the fact that we can't even talk about it makes it incredibly hard to have legitimate conversations with people and hear people out. And that's what I hope this does, is not any sort of partisan thing, but just kind of presenting a potential reality of where I thought we were heading. Well, and it looks like a lot of the things, yeah. I mean, I think that's the scariest part. It's when we were talking about when the bill got passed, the hyperboles, and people were like, that's never going to happen. Yeah. Those things will never happen. Um, Y'all are being crazy. You know, what's wrong with you? And, um, and I think as women, we knew that there really was a different reality, right? And I'm sure y'all are all familiar with um, these amazing women that are serving now. Um, and so would love for you to read their bios that you have in front of you, and we're not going to waste any time with, because they all have very long bios, let me tell you. Um, but Sonia, what's your reaction to this film? So first of all, I am thrilled to be here with each and every single one of you. I thought your film was gripping like to the edge of your seat, gripping, um, rooting for the character, you know, you wanted to hear that, whatever, <laughs> you, wanted, you wanted to hear that every single time. Um, but I definitely think it drew a very, very stark picture of what we f worry will become reality because it starts from a legislative perspective, of course, it starts with one little shift, right? So Roe v. Wade gets overturned, the next thing you know, there's an avalanche of other things that begin to happen. And because most of it can feel um, very much out of your control, it becomes really terrifying. And for women, I mean, as I sat and watched, I mean, there were so many pieces of the story, and I'm, so I'm also a mom. I've got three kids, I've been married 22 years, and, and it doesn't matter, because you showed a story of a young woman who's unmarried, but a lot of what you depicted really is something that any woman of any childbearing age can feel, any given month. And one of the things, and then I'm going to wrap it up, but one of the things that we don't talk enough about in the, in the reproductive rights conversation is really how many married women with children 
find themselves in a situation where they have to decide, can they bring another child into the, the house that they have and into their existing family? And so um, I, thought you'd, I thought it was brilliantly done. And, um, and we, these are the things that we worry about. We'll talk more as we go, I'm sure, as to what do we think might be coming next, even in Georgia. But I mean, you don't quite know just how far it can go. And that is where I think we all, and starting with you saying, well, what can I do? And you created this film. What can I do to make sure that you know, the world that I want to see is the world that I'm actually able to live in? Well, and I think with respect to that, I feel like every week there is another headline, in part because there are a lot of lawsuits that are kind of making their way through the courts. And um, Senator Representative Al. Um, I have all things. <laughs> to, you are every woman. Um, it, also because you're a physician, though. Um, so just this week, you know, we see that the Supreme Court has told, you know, Texas doctors that, you know, you don't have to provide abortion care to a woman even if her life's in danger. And so as a physician, kind of what's your response to, to those kind of rulings coming down? So when I hear about what's coming out of Texas in regards to EMTALA law, for, for people who don't know, EMTALA law is a law that was passed in the 1980s under President Ronald Reagan that uh, basically said, and this is a good law, that says that if you present to the emergency room for any reason, that the emergency room cannot turn you away until they stabilize you and treat you as needed. And that is a good law. I think we can understand why, why that is necessary. That law was passed in order to prohibit um, ERs and hospital systems from turfing patients, as we say in the vernacular, uh, patients who are maybe don't have insurance or patients that they don't want to treat for whatever reason that they can't just be like, nope, get out of here, go across the street to Grady or you know, whatever, whatever happens in unscrupulous systems. So this is a good federal law. What Texas has said now, uh, through the Supreme Court is that if the type of stabilizing or treatment that is required for a patient involves abortion care, then EMTALA law no longer applies. Um, so what that means is that if a patient comes in who is pregnant with, let's say, hemorrhage, sepsis, any number of things that we can imagine could happen, that that hospital is no longer required under law to treat that patient in a way that is, that is definitive, and in a way that is spelled out by best practices, medical societies, the, the care we know we're supposed to give, we don't have to give it anymore, right? That said, what it really means is that doctors and healthcare providers who still wanna treat the patient, right? They know, we know what we have to do, right? Like we all went to medical school, we all trained, that if we do take care of the patient in compliance with our Hippocratic Oath, with our ethical standards, with our own moral code, that we are now liable and criminalized for providing the best care that we know how to provide. So I don't know how this type of law and this type of environment squares with the ethical practice of medicine. In order to become a physician or become a healthcare practitioner, we do take an oath. So what they're doing is they are forcing us every single day to violate that oath. And every time we see a patient, evaluate a patient who may be pregnant or may not be pregnant, we don't know, right? Um, that we are put in this position of choosing between our ethical and moral standards and choosing between our livelihoods, our licensure, our family's livelihoods, our personal safety. And this is really an untenable situation. And when you look at states like Texas, like Georgia, states that have very strict abortion bans, it's not a coincidence that many of these states are also suffering healthcare worker um, shortages. Uh, and there's a reason for that because why would we choose to continue to practice medicine in an environment that criminalizes that care? Well, it, it, and there's even like another layer to it because it's the Hippocratic Oath, but it's also the, the medical standard of care. And so you really are pitting the patient and the doctor against each other and said it, that there really is a, a situation where you could have a doctor sued for not providing an abortion right. because that was what was necessary to save a woman's life. 
but they didn't do it because of the state law that had criminalized the behavior. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. And you're a lawyer. You, you know these things that when a, a physician or a practitioner is brought up for a malpractice suit, what we do is we look at the practice standards. What are the standards of ACOG, the American College of uh, Gynecologists and Obstetricians? Um, what do they say is the best practice? Um, that best practice may be illegal, right? In, in states like Georgia or states like Texas. So it really puts practitioners in an impossible situation of not knowing how to take care of their patients. And for younger physicians, uh, what we hear now in Georgia is that people are not choosing to train in OBGYN in Georgia because they know they're not going to get the full scope of the training they need. If, you know, I've talked to students about this, and this is just the frank language that we use. If we are not trained on how to empty a uterus, we cannot take care of our patients, right? We are not being trained to the full standards that we need in order to save lives. So not only do we not have physicians staying in Georgia, we don't have the pipeline of, of physicians who may have grown up in Georgia, want to stay here, treat, you know, train future doctors. Everyone is leaving, right? So this is, this is the environment we set up. It's not just a problem in, in the immediacy, but it's a generational problem that we're going to see. Um, we may not even see the full impact for another four years, eight years, 10 years, but we're going to see it. Well, and we're going to see it. Uh, and I think, too, we, we're already seeing it, um, especially with lack of, of women in rural areas being able to get care. Not only are we talking about, you know, the maternal mortality rate and infant mortality, but um, we're also talking about the foster care system, yeah. right, mm -hmm. where we're already having to house children in hotels. The state of Georgia is paying for children to stay in hotels because there are not enough foster families to take care of them. I mean, there are missing foster children. But we have now put into place a law that necessarily is going to push more children into that system because you are forcing people who do not want to have children to have these children. And what are they going to do? And many times they can't take care of them. They're unable. They abandon them. All of, all of the things you can think of. And so it, it's interesting because there are all these other implications with respect to abortion that have nothing to do with it, right? And it's, and it's like nobody is thinking about that mm -hmm. because it really is about control a lot of the time. And so, Shay, you're a lawyer, like, <laughs> like I am. Um, <laughs> I feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> As you should, doctor. I don't sue doctors. I'm a real estate lawyer. I don't sue doctors. <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> well, I'll sue anybody. But, um, if you do the wrong thing. Um, you are one of the sponsors of the law, kind of the, the reproductive health rights bill that we just love and we think it's great. Um, but... First of all, talk about what it does, but also talk about the realities of, is there, is, do you think that there is any reality to actually getting it passed? So um, I filed last session HB 75, which is the um, Georgia Reproductive Freedom Act. And thank you. <laughs> and it was the work of a lot of people. Um, Amplify Georgia, which is a collaborative that um, many of the reproductive care organizations are kind of under their umbrella. Um, and what it, I don't know that we had any thought that it would actually get a hearing or move forward, but we just felt like it was really important in this moment to talk about what our true vision for reproductive freedom is in Georgia. And that goes beyond Roe, because for so long, Black and brown people have not been able to access care. And so, and so thank you, Diane. Um, and so it not only repeals the ugliness of the six-week abortion ban. We all know how ugly that is. Most of us wouldn't even know we were pregnant. Um, but it also uh, requires Medicaid and insurance companies to cover that care. And so, um, you know, we are going to continue to highlight this issue, it, we're just, I don't know if y'all have been following all the lawsuits, but um, I know Jen and I had discussions about how we believed the abortion ban was illegal because, and I use this in my land use cases, 
they knew it was unconstitutional the moment they passed that bill because Roe was still the law of the land. And for decades in, in Georgia, just like we saw the US Supreme Court not um, accept 50 years of precedent, the Georgia Supreme Court has just done the same by overturning Judge McBurney's decision that said, because it was unconstitutional at the time it was passed, it was void at the time it was passed. And so I don't know about the other lawyers on this team. My husband's a lawyer too, and our love language is to talk about <laughs> all these crazy cases at home. Um, I know, it's, it's sick. <laughs> but we have two daughters, and I mean, they're in their 20s, and your film was just so powerful for me because not only can I remember back to college and scares with boyfriends, but now I'm fighting so hard because I have daughters that are at that age right now. And um, I have my own abortion story. It's much different than that. But um, it's just really uh, mind boggling. But anyway, back to the lawsuit. So, so Brian and I, we sit there and we, we don't know what law students are learning anymore because we're taught to identify an issue research the law, make sure it's called shepherdizing, make sure it hasn't been overturned. I mean, we rely on precedent to advise our clients on how successful they may be in a case. And now we've got the US Supreme Court and the Georgia Supreme Court ignoring years of, pre decades of precedent. And so um, I really feel like, you know, our government was set up with three branches to be kind of checks and balances, right? And the judicial system was set up to protect the people from a overreaching government. And now the courts are so politicized that they're not protecting the people, they're voting along with whoever's in charge of the government. And that is terrifying to me and why we have to keep fighting so hard. So we are gonna continue to push out this bill um, just to keep it in the limelight. It, you know, that's what we can do right now. And then the bigger thing is we have to elect more Democrats. <laughs> Preferably women. Pro-choice Democrats. Pro Democrats, sorry. Let me be, yeah. So we need 12 more seats in the House to take the majority. Um, and I know we won't have the trifecta like Minnesota and Michigan who've done some amazing things in one session. But if we get one chamber, they can't get any bad stuff through and they have to talk to us and work with us if they even wanna get some good stuff through. And so that's gonna give us the most leverage. So if you can do anything this year, 2024, I know the Biden-Trump thing is front and center of everybody's minds, but the state legislature really right now has more impact on anybody's lives than even Congress, um, and so, because everything's been pushed down to the states, and so please, just reach out, adopt a candidate in one of our target seats, go knock doors, donate, because this is really where we can make a change. Well, and I think, and really quickly, it's interesting, because we saw, it, we see real energy around referendums, right? And that's where we've seen people People in incredibly conservative states, the reddest states, come out and and say, no, this is the one thing we want to make sure um, is protected, our, our, a woman's right to an abortion. Um, and so a lot of people I know, very bright people, have been like, let's do the same thing here in Georgia, right? Um, and then you got to kind of be like, rah, rah. Right. Well... I agree, it's so frustrating because I get asked that question every day. Why can't Georgia do that? So there are 24 states in the country that have some version of a direct initiative or referendum. Most of them were enshrined in their constitutions when the states were formed. Uh, the last time someone put it in their actual law was in 1992. But I have um, been working on Primarily, again, we know it's messaging. They're probably not likely to take it, but we know that more than 60% of this state wants access to abortion, wants Medicaid expansion, wants common sense gun laws, wants fair maps, and 
literally the Republicans are holding us hostage, and that is not a representative government, and that's why these direct initiatives were set up. For extreme situations, you have to get a lot of signatures on a petition, you have to make sure that the language is written, you know, very succinctly, one topic. So I am working, I will be filing, hopefully the week of the anniversary of Roe, um, a legislation to uh, ask that we have the ability to do a direct initiative. Um, so. it, it's the worst that we have to keep doing these messaging bills, um, knowing that the likelihood, but again, they won't even give us a hearing on these things. Michelle has gotten one hearing on a gun safety bill. I mean, they just won't even let the people talk about these things. The other thing that I will be doing the week of uh, the 22nd, it, and I haven't gotten the date yet, but we will, um, the Democratic House Caucus has been hosting their own committee meetings. Um, Secretary Cannon just did one on maternal mortality last week. Doc, uh, Rep Al, Dr. Al, all of the things, is doing one on uh, Medicaid expansion next week, and then the week of the 22nd, I'll be doing one on reproductive freedom. Um, and so if anyone wants to reach out to me, if you have stories you want to tell or there are doctors or experts that want to come and talk about what they know has been going on since the abortion ban went into effect, um, please reach out to me. So one of the one of the reasons I think that what Julian has done is so important is really because young people seem to be very frustrated, disaffected, unhappy, um, I think we're seeing that in a lot of the poll numbers with respect to Biden. Um, and there is a real, there's a real uneasiness out there. And young people seem to be really pissed off, I have to say. Um, and not just my kids, right? <laughs> but Darshan, you were one of the youngest members of the General Assembly when you were elected in 2010, right? That was a long time ago. <laughs> And you're still one of the youngest. That tells you something, though, right? Maybe we need to set, like, some kind of age limit or something. I don't know. Whatever. But, um, but you are leading a, basically a group of younger electeds. Um, you're one of the founding members. And so why did you think that was important, and, and specifically in terms of trying to get young gay, um, voters engaged, especially when we're talking about issues that really impact them, right, the most? So let me just clarify that I'm middle age, but um, I used to be young. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the Georgia Future Caucus is a bipartisan, bicameral caucus um, of state legis uh, legislators, and I co-founded it with a Republican probably seven or eight uh, years ago, and it's for legislators under the age of 45. I am under 45, so I'll give myself that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but, you know, one of the things that I appreciate about getting elected at so young and founding this caucus is um, that young people really are focused more on quality of life issues um, than older generations. And so that's the reason that you see them changing the workplace and being very intentional about where they work and how they do things because they wanna be connected to some cause that they can really sink their teeth into. Um, and so this caucus was a good way to, to have those discussions. Now, even though this is a bipartisan caucus, um, one of the things that came out of the caucus is our ability to at least have conversations. Um, and that's important, uh, particularly for younger voters, um, because they don't want people telling them what to do. They, they want to have these discussions. And so uh, I've been able to make uh, effective use of, of social media. It has gotten me in trouble plenty of times, but <laughs> I have been able to make eff effective use of it. And so when we were doing HB 481, um, I've got what year it is, I did a notorious tweet um, where I listed out what I called a testicular bill of rights, and it went <laughs> viral. And I tweeted it out, and it got picked up everywhere. And it essentially what it did is it said, if you want to control my ovaries, then I get to control your testicles. And it was a testicular <laughs> bill of rights. 
And so it went viral. People were talking about it. And I actually had men and younger people and older people um, reach out to me and say, you know, I never really considered that, you know, if you're going to control, if we're going to control your body that you can't control. It's amazing when you turn it on its head what people think about. Um, but I think this is really going to be hopefully one of those issues that transcends beyond young voters because if you think about it at its core really is about control and power right and so i had a bill um or i have a bill hb1 now for those of you in the legislature well in the in the state <laughs> in the state house um so the story behind HB1, we had a legislator, God rest his soul, he, um, he died, but every year he would file a bill and it's, it's numbered, the bills are numbered numerically. So when you go to, to file it, whatever number you're in, um, in HB1, he would run to make sure that his bill was HB1. It, it was to ban abortion outright. He did it for years. And so I intentionally, intentionally ran to make sure that I file HB1. And what HB1 does is if a woman gets, um, is forced to, um, to keep a child and, and denied an abortion under HB481, then she has a private right of action in order to sue the state of Georgia for a healthcare costs, for a child's tuition all the way through college, for any lost wages, for everything. Because the point is, is you can't, you know, say you have to have a, a child and then take your hands off once the child gets here. That's, that's the hypocrisy that I always like to point out with these Republicans. They are so hypocritical. Um, and so I, I hope that that message, just pointing out that hypocrisy spans every generation. It, it spans from rural to urban to black to white, because that's something that we can all get around. I hate it when people are, uh, you know, uh, hypocrites. And I hope that that transcends, um, you know, any, anything that you might, you know, have about this particular issue, if we could just con continue to point out how they will protect the unborn, but as soon as the child is here, then it's all hands off, you know, you're, you're on your own. We need to continue to tell how hypocritical that message is. So, and Shay had mentioned this about the, um, the bill that went, so the challenge to 41 that went up to the Georgia Supreme Court, the Georgia Supreme Court rejected what Judge McBurney did at the Fulton County level, which was um, what he said is at the time it was passed, it was unconstitutional. That means it's void, ergo court. Um, the court says to the legislature, just pass it again, right? Which seemed to be a pretty good way to approach it. Um, and, and specifically because in 2019 when this thing got passed, every single Republican I talked to said, it ain't going anywhere, right? Like, it's gonna get stopped at the US Supreme Court level, we're doing this for messaging, we're doing this to feed, you know, the right, all of these things, you know, it's just like, pipe down, Jen, stop, stop yelling, right? Um, it's not that big of a deal. And now, I think everybody, the Republicans were surprised, right, that, that this is, is where we are now. Um, and kind of all the bad stuff that's happened with, you know, whether you're talking about, like we said, with doctors and, and the like, all kind of the, the, the downstream effects. So I think the hope was that they were going to, the Supreme Court was at least going to give us an opportunity to repass something where there would be actual conversation about, okay, what, what should this be? What are the limits that should be there? Or what are the protections that should be in place? And so with that said, Sonia, what do you, what do you think about if, if we were able to do that? Do you think the conversation would be very different? This is a 
great question because from the time it was passed till now, we actually have added more women, Democratic women, to the point that was just made to the legislature. So that does change somewhat the dynamic of the conversation. It certainly adds more voices into the conversation who could speak against the bill and really even work behind the scenes with colleagues across the aisle to try to get them to a particular position that we'd want them to be in. But, but here's, here's the truth, right? In the same way that you had people back in 2019 who said, I'm not comfortable voting yes on this, but I'm going to anyway, because where is it going to go? That kind of tribalism still exists today. And that's part of what is, is really driving some of the ways that people vote. The expectation is if you are Republican, you would vote yes on any kind of abortion ban or even further restriction. And so I don't know entirely how you get around that. And I've talked to colleagues uh, once Roe v. Wade was um, overturned who really, I mean, you, you've, you've got enough people down there who really do say and believe, and, and, and they have the right to do so. But, you know, I always learn that life starts at conception. So that's their starting point. And so I think the, what has to happen is more dialogue. What we don't have in the legislature, and this is the ugly truth, right, is a lot of room for dialogue, especially when you're looking at bills and they're right in front of you. We've got our committee meetings and our committee hearings, but there's not that long of a stretch of time to dig into d issues deeply enough to be able to really change people's minds kind of in the 40-day span that we would have to change a mind. You, we, every now and again, we get really, I, I'm gonna say, lucky, right? And, and the decision is made to just like stop and take a pause and a beat, which then gives us an additional year before we may come back to an issue. Um, but the issue of abortion is not one I don't think that is completely done in our state. We had a bill last year, 23, or was that 22? Anyway, it would have dealt with the abortion pill. And so we put a pause on that. But I'm hearing some talk about that coming back again this year. We'll see. We don't know until it happens. But, you know, it's how do you keep pushing the boundaries on this issue? To some extent, right, the courts just ruled, the law stands, but there still may be an effort to push it further and further and further. And yet, at the same time, I don't think that anybody in the state of Georgia, besides maybe those of us, you know, like-minded, uh, like those of us in this room, would like to see the ballot referendum because every time it goes to, to the public, it is clear that abortion is the, 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 pro, the right to choose is one that everybody agrees with. So it's, it's a fascinating dynamic, right? Because there is this piece of the power of being in the legislature and being able to make change happen, even, and the tension is against knowing that the vast majority of the people wouldn't want to see the change that you're making in this regard. Yeah. Representative um, Shade said it when she said the gun issues, we, we've got the polling. We know where Georgians stand on the issues and yet we'll still see bills introduced and sometimes moved. Um, and, it, and, it, and it then becomes nothing to do at all with the people and really everything to do with politics and power. Well, and now, Dr. Senator Representative Al, <laughs> um, you, you have now been in both chambers and you've been a, and you've been a practicing physician in both chambers, and so I know that you have always you used to call it the um, the doctor caucus, mm -hmm. and so the physicians would try to kind of come together, um, and at least if they could get on the same page, right, then maybe th they could educate their colleagues. 
have you seen anything that, that makes you think that this is more successful in one house or the other? Because you, you keep trying, dear. <laughs> I mean, you know, you keep working those relationships, which is great, but it also has to be really frustrating when you're talking about people who are passing laws and they know nothing about what they are passing. <laughs> Part of that sentiment is why I ran for office, is hearing people pass bills like HB 481 and literally not knowing the first thing of what they were talking about, <laughs> be it embryology, biology, the human body, where the uterus is, you know, <laughs> details, minor the womb. details. Yeah. The womb, yes, that's my red flag word. I mean, someone says the womb, I'm like, not oh, no. in, in anatomy and physiology. Not, not a real the thing. Womb. But in terms of the doctor's caucus, you know, at the time that I was in the Senate with you guys, uh, we had five doctors in the state legislature. There were four in the Senate side and one in the House. Now, because I've moved over to the House and Dr. Dean Burke has gone on to uh, greener pastures and less political pastures, I'm sure he's relieved about that, now we have two and two in each chamber. And I will say, um, as a, you know, to, to concede this a very important point is actually the Doctors' Caucus is, is um, remarkably effective in that we are able sometimes when we're talking to our colleagues to denude the uh, politicization of certain issues out and people tend to talk to us more as clinicians first and as politicians second, which is helpful. I will say with respect to the um, medication abortion ban that we saw last year, advanced by our, our labor commissioner, uh, at the time Senator Bruce Thompson, SB 456, see I still remember it, I'm really good at remembering these numbers, 456 uh, that aimed to uh, restrict the um, availability of abortion medication, which in a state like Georgia is particularly pertinent. This was right before Dobbs came out, but we knew that Dobbs was coming down because it was leaked, so we all knew it was gonna happen. Is that in a state like Georgia with a six week ban that really the vast majority of abortions that are taking place uh, are via medication abortions. That's nationally, right, not just in Georgia. And that you are taking a state with uh, really very stringent restrictions and further restricting it to the point that patients, especially with very poor healthcare access, for example, rural patients would have essentially no access at all. And I think what that showed in seeing that bill moving through was that it wasn't enough to pass 481, right? 481 was their big victory and they got it. The dog caught the car and they were very surprised and they're like, oh, we did it, shit. Right? Um, but that it's not gonna stop them, right? Like it's not enough. They are gonna keep going and chipping away at it until there's no access at all. What I will say about uh, SB 456, um, Sonia noted that that bill died uh, over on the House side eventually. But even in the Senate side, though it passed out of HHS, which is the committee on which we sat, um, we were able to chip away at it and take away a lot of the problematic elements. And that was not just because I was uh, asking pointed questions in committee, but because behind the scenes, I was working with some members of the Doctors' Caucus to whom they would be more receptive because some of our partners are Republicans. All, all of the other doctors are Republicans. We're able to have these conversations and um, I won't say this person's name, but it'll be obvious when I say that she was my beard um, and she was a broker and uh, she said, give me all your points, everything you said in committee, write it down um, as amendments and I will bring it to him and he'll sit down with me and we'll talk about it. So I don't mean to just slag on Republicans constantly. Um, sometimes they do help us. Sometimes it's the only way we can get these things done is to work with our Republican um, colleagues on certain issues, but generally speaking, it makes it much, much harder to not have pro-choice, democratic, largely women, at the table to just get it done in a straightforward way rather than by backdoor means. Yeah. Well, and, and, and just as a point, kind of an order, one of the physicians that you referenced was actually an OBGYN and, and he still voted for 481. Um, because it was about team, right? It was about team and not necessarily about representing the constituents or the people. And another one's an ER doc. Yeah. Um, <laughs> interesting. Um, so Shay, uh, you ran in 2018. Yes. Okay. And I lost by 1,200 votes. <laughs> right, and then you came back. I came back and because of 481. Yep because of 481 and you ran, I mean, and you won that time. 337 votes. <laughs> Not that she, <laughs> closest <laughs> race in Georgia. Um, but with, with respect to that, 
lot of the reason you ran, especially the second time and came back with respect to 481, was because you yourself had had a very personal experience that, you know, you started to share on the campaign trail. And with respect to that, do you think sharing that experience, because we do, it's, it, we make women basically share their trauma um, to justify their existence and, and their autonomy <laughs> An agency, and it's so ridiculous. Um, but with respect to, to running, do you yeah. think it made a difference or not? Um, so in 28, so my story um, is a little bit different than the film, obviously. I was 37. Um, my husband and I very much wanted the baby. We found out that it had trisomy 18, which means that it would either be stillborn or live a few minutes outside my bo body uh, with no real chance for viability at all or a healthy viability for sure. Um, and so we made the heart-wrenching decision to um, terminate. Meanwhile, my five-year-old had been kissing my belly and talking to her little brother and sister. So it was one of the most heart-wrenching times in my life, but I didn't tell the story in 2018 because like so many of us, Rose always gonna protect us, right? And then in 2019, I was down at the Capitol when that passed and I just remember thinking, oh my God, if my daughters were forced to carry a baby. And by the way, the doctor said, You're, you have two little kids at home. It's really hard on a woman's body to carry a baby to term. And any of you out here who have, you know what we're talking about. Um, and so don't risk your life and being able to continue to take care of those two kids. And so the thought that my daughters would not be able to make those same decisions that I did for their families, I, I just said no. Uh, not on my watch. And so, yes, I did start telling my story. I even, right after Roe passed, published an op-ed piece in on the Fox News digital um, platform because I know that we need to be having conversations with people that don't agree with us. And I wanted them to hear my story and maybe have some empathy and maybe think twice about it. I don't know that I changed, a, I've changed one mind. Um, I had a Republican in my district reach out and say I was very brave to put it there, that she thought I was right, and for the first time she was going to be voting Democrat. So that was huge, um, but w what those numbers were, I don't know, but one, one is better than none. Um, so I have a friend right now who is going through my story, um, and she's waiting for news one way or the other, and she told me that um, her doctors will have to petition, so I don't know who they petition, but uh, for her to be able to have an abortion if the child is not viable, if the pregnancy is not viable, um, and otherwise she's gonna have to go out of state. And thank God Georgia doesn't yet have a penalty for going out of state, but um, I think back to, I mean, that was one of the hardest times in my life to have to worry about that on top of it is just criminal. And I just think, I say it all the time, I'll take my last breath fighting to make sure we restore our kids and grandkids' rights because the fact that they can't enjoy the same rights I've enjoyed my entire life is not acceptable. Darshan, you have um, served in the House since 2010. I mentioned that earlier. So you really are, although you're the youngest, you're also the most senior in, in <laughs> terms of, of how long you've served, right? So, um, and I've even seen a shift with respect to attitudes toward abortion and choice and talking about reproductive health care, um, you know, in the last five years. So with respect to since 2010, can you just talk about generally what you've observed in terms of people's attitudes or, or openness to even talking about some of these issues um, in terms of the General Assembly on both sides of the aisle? Because, you know, abortion is a very complicated issue, which is also why it should be an individual issue, because it should be left for the individual to make a decision one way or the other, so. So, yes, yeah, so, um Generally speaking, I have seen the abortion issue go from one in which 
Republicans or conservatives say, okay, well, we know that the base, that's one of our, you know, check marks on our platform to wholly get uh, uh, around it, and you'll see it even in the presidential race, trying to make it the issue. For example, when I first got elected, um, there was a Democrat, there was a Democrat um, lawyer out of Athens that um, was running for chair of the uh, House Democratic Caucus. And so he called me, he's a lawyer, I'm a lawyer. And I was like, this is great, this is, a, you know, I'm gonna support a lawyer. Um, and so we had elections and elected him as chair of the House Democratic Caucus. Less than a week later, he had a big press conference. He switched parties and carried the bill to, ch to change it to 20 seat week, 26 weeks abortion. I gave that man what for? <laughs> <laughs> that entire time. So every time somebody flips or says something, I always say, you've been McKillop. That's his last name. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so they used him um, to prove himself to be worthy of the Republican Party by making him carry that bill. And what I see now, because, you know, they, you know, they, it, they didn't make a really a big deal around it at the time. They were just like, if you want to prove that you're really a Republican, you know, you know, um, carry this bill. And so it passed. But what we saw with 481 that came eight years, seven or eight years uh, later, is now you have the whole Republican Party getting around this six-week abortion ban. So it went from, hey, we'll just give somebody something to do to prove their worth. We'll like, you know, sort of hands off. We'll support it, but we're not going to, you know, make a big deal about it or tell our members they have to vote for it to really where you see it being that issue for them. Um, and I think it's not going to serve them very well to, 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 to do that because even conservative polls, to um, S Senator Halpern's point, most Americans say that there should be access to abortion. Now, we can disagree about the amount of time, but most people are going to agree past six weeks because most women don't know that they're pregnant at that time. And so for me, I have seen, and, and not even the abortion issues, just other issues about guns and just other stuff, it has become so um, much about um, what I call Trump's new party issues than it is about serving the people here in the state of Georgia, um, that it is just absolutely uh, amazing. When I go back to my district, um, which is in East Cab and South Gwinnett, um, they care about transportation, you know, because because of the traffic. They care about jobs. They care about um, taking care of their families. And the fact that the legislature um, and Republicans want to make that one of their hallmark issues when there's so many other things that we could be taken care of is just amazing to me. So uh, I hope that this trend doesn't continue, um, but that's what I've sort of observed uh, over the last uh, few years of, of being there. They, they've really taken it from, we're gonna support this Republican on this issue to making it sort of their brand. Well, what's interesting about the story you told, there is a little bit of justice in the world because Doug McKillop flipped. Um, he represented the Athens area. He was told he needed to, to, to show his loyalty by you know, carrying this bill. He goes back and he got beat by a, a woman in the Republican yep. primary yep. who was pro-choice. And she was backed by winless, wasn't she? No, okay, well, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Okay, okay. Right. We'll give her a solid for that. But whatever. Um, do we have time for questions? No time for questions, y'all. Um, well, let's just wrap it up with, so Jillian, what are you going to be doing in the next few months with respect to the film in terms of um, trying to push it out there, get the message out there? Um, just, just some of the basics of what you're going to be doing. Well, um, <laughs> So my goal with this film is I would love to be now as hands-off as I can be. Because at this point, um, it's kind of up to y'all. Not just in this room, but everyone who sees it and shares it. Um, we have a really you know, interconnected country, interconnected globe with 
social media, with YouTube, with all the things that we can see. So um, if you did enjoy what you saw, if you found it to be impactful, the goal that I have with this film that's always been true is just I want people to talk about it. Because like at the end of the film, you know, the mom walks in and sees a daughter and it ends on that because there is no right, I mean, there's a right or wrong answer, but there's no, I didn't want to put any spin on that. You don't know what the mom does. I don't know what the mom does. And that's up to, you know, everyone who watches it to put their, to, to, to feel that. Well, you know, does the mom turn her daughter in and kill her daughter? Does the mom, you know, and, and the fact is the, the girl doesn't even know if she is pregnant or not. She could just be late but has to go through this whole rigmarole because, you know, she doesn't know and doesn't have any options. So to show that to me, like, you know, if you are um, pro-life and you have a daughter or have a wife or have a sister or anyone who has a capacity anatomically to get pregnant, you know, think about their life. Because even if you want to get pregnant as a woman now, like you were saying, even if you want to have the child, you're risking your life throughout all nine months. And even upon you know, having the pregnancy, giving, delivering, you could die. And so like now for me, it's like we're not women anymore, we're incubators the moment we are fertilized. And so I would like to maintain my autonomy as a person and a human being. And I think everyone in here agrees with that, so I will step off the soapbox. But my point is, like, I just think that I, I've done my part. <laughs> and I would love to continue to help to have screenings and do things like that. But having people and audience members share it um, is the most important thing and is a way to spark those conversations. Because this is not a politicized, it should not be a politicized topic. It should be a human topic. So. <laughs> So, uh, we will be sharing it on Tuesday. Um, so the, this panel has been recorded, so that will be available, but the film will be released uh, on YouTube. Um, so easy way to just, it's free. So share it, yeah. watch it, post about it. Um, you can also find all the information um, if you want to. There's still a little bit of time, so I'm gonna plug this like so quickly. Um, but. <laughs> Uh, if you do really enjoy what you saw, um, filmmaking is not free and neither is distributing it or anything like that. So if you do, and like holding more screenings and things like this, if you liked what you saw, there are, uh, there's a donation page on the website. It's L8, the official short.com. You can scan the QR codes. You'll find it. You'll find it. Um, and on that page is a donate here, like link. Click that, it gives you all the options you can do. If you want to be a producer of any kind, $500 and up, okay? L like, within the next 24 hours, or you can't do it, sorry. <laughs> so, but you know, really put a fire. But thank you, that's all. Thank you. Okay. Well, ladies, um, tomorrow starts the um, the glorious 40 days that are the most dangerous in the state of Georgia every year. Um, so with respect to uh, women, men, people in this state who are really concerned about um, issues like this and reproductive health, what's kind of a call, call to action for your constituents? What do you think really works? versus what you don't think works. And so if you were gonna tell your constituent one thing to do or two things to do, what would it be? Before you can do anything, you gotta know what we're up to and what we're doing. I would say follow what we're doing and tap into that. And there's a couple of ways you can do that. Every single committee meeting is um, streamed. You don't have to come down and be there in person. They are recorded and I believe accessible even after the fact. Um, but you can follow along on the website, legis.ga.gov, and you can see what's happening in the House separately from what's happening in the Senate. You can see the calendar, so if there is a time when you want to come and actually 
listen in in person in a hearing, in a, in a committee meeting. You can see exactly when that's going to be. Every committee meeting has an agenda that has to be posted. Usually, though, you're not going to get a lot of notice on that. So I would say if, if you know that there are particular issues that you're interested in and you know you've got a House rep or a state senator who is really high on those issues as well, be connected to those people. I mean, the number one thing you can ever do is know who your representatives are and be in conversation with us, whether that's during session or at a session. <laughs> So we're well aware that we live in a state with a Republican trifecta, right? Republicans have the majority in the House and the Senate, but we know that that's not what the state looks like, right? We have a non-representative majority. That said, there is strength in the numbers that we see in a room like this, right? And um, I think Shay alluded to the fact that we got a, a hearing on a bill that doesn't traditionally get a hearing in a very Republican state, and that was a, a gun safety bill having to do with safe storage. And the reason that we got that bill in front of the committee to be heard is not because I'm so charming, though I am, <laughs> but it's because of folks like you, right? Because what we did with that bill in particular, that has to do with protecting children from unsecured weapons, seems pretty straightforward, but what we did is we got such a large and wide coalition of partners across the entire state of Georgia and created an environment, both physical, virtual, in every way that we knew how, that was so uncomfortable for Republicans to keep ignoring the issue and keep saying no, that eventually they had to hear it because just to like shut us up. Like honestly, that's, that's what the chairman said. He's like, stop coming to my office, <laughs> please. <laughs> we'll hear it, right? So that's, that's the same approach that I think we have to take with when I fully expect that this medication abortion bill is gonna come back, right? So when issues like that in this space come back up, that's the approach we have to take because it, it works, right? It works, we killed it the first time, we'll kill it the second time. But even more than that, that we'll advance good bills like Shay's bill, HB 75. That's how we do it, right? To make it so impossible for them to keep ignoring us that they have to listen. Absolutely. So all of us have social media pages you can subscribe to to also keep up with what we're personally doing on this topic and these issues. Um, but the other thing, I think I mentioned it before, is we have to flip the house. And um, I've participated in helping recruit two amazing women I see right here in the audience who are running for two of our top target seats, um, Susie Greenberg and Laura Mervardian. Did I say it right? Okay. Um, yeah. Are there, are there any other candidates in the room? Please stand up and let us, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for running. It is a big job, we all know. So adopt one of these amazing women and go knock doors for them, donate to them, help them. That is the biggest thing you can do is help us flip the house. Uh, yeah, round of applause. So I'm gonna echo everything that everyone else said. Um, and it's important that you know who your state rep and who your senator are. Um, and I'm gonna ask my legislative aide to put 15 more minutes on my park mobile on my phone. Thank you. <laughs> um, sorry, really quickly, I also just wanted to say that this was not an individual effort. So everyone in the room who was part of this, my producers, Ashlyn and Maya and Rachel and Brian and everybody who was in here and was here today, thank you very much, genuinely from the bottom of my heart. And then to those who like were not part of the film yet, yet, um, if you do want to do any kind of Zoom screening, in-person screening, I'm happy to go and talk to groups, happy to help facilitate those kind of screenings. So please let me or Melita know, um, because again, spreading the word and sharing this message um, is, is the, the way that I can help. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, to close out the program, I want to um, introduce the vice chair of the Georgia Win List Board, Camille Jackson. She served in the Georgia House for two terms, representing the Albany area, um, mm -hmm. before moving to Atlanta because she fell in love with another representative and married him, <laughs> Representative Derek Jackson. <laughs> yeah. 
and she's an executive at Bank of America. So Camille, you want to say some words? Thank you so much, Jen, for that introduction. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to these amazing women on this panel. Um, I do miss y'all. I don't miss the fight that y'all are going into tomorrow, but I do miss you. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, I just have to say that I, the day that HB 481 passed was an, an extremely somber day. And then when um, Roe v. Wade got overturned, that was another somber day. And then just, Jillian, you highlighting the futuristic penalties that we could potentially face just made me feel all somber again because I'm, I, it's, it's just crazy where we are. And all I can do is encourage everyone here to continue to fight because um, as it was mentioned, I think Shay might have mentioned it, that um, we only need a few more seats to, um, to, um, to win the House. Uh, we have a lot more work to do on the Senate side, but at least we can, we can kind of stop some of the craziness that's going on. Um, but I encourage all of you here to, first of all, I'm just happy to see that we have a full house, but I want to encourage you all to continue to get out and vote. I know everyone in this room is voting, but encourage those around you to get out and vote and fight for what Jillian is, has highlighted for us today, because it is so important that we continue to fight for our rights. It is, I mean, you all already know that women rule the world, so you know we need to make sure that our women are protected and that they are safe. So, um, just you know, thank you all for for you being here. I have a few um, additional notes that I need to get out real quick. Um, first of all, panelists, do not leave because we need to take pictures. Um, um, our audience, please don't leave because we have plenty of popcorn. So grab some popcorn before you leave the door, okay? <laughs> um, also. Um, I want to acknowledge our board members present on the Georgia Win list. Um, first of all, um, you already saw her. She came up here for a brief moment, but I want to again um, have acknowledge our, our fearless leader, Melita. <laughs> and do we have any other Georgia Win list um, members here? All right. Oh, oh, there's oh, and there's our other fearless leader up top, and um, oh, and there's Corey. So thank you all for being here as well. Oh, I can't see over there the light. Uh, Linda, hey Linda, thanks for being here. And then also, um, um, do we have any additional elected officials here that um, are that may be in the audience that we did not recognize? All right, all right, let's see what else we have here. Um, oh, just want to highlight that there are applications available for our 2024 Winlist Academy, and that's basically where we teach women how to run campaigns, how to get elected. And so if you or anyone you know is interested in, in, in running for office, definitely um, go to our website and look at um, how you can actually do that. Um, this training is amazing. Um, Nicole does the training for us. Thank you, Nicole. And um, it, you know, it just helps continue to um, get more women elected across the state of Georgia, and that is what we need. Uh, oh yeah, that's that's yeah. <laughs> yeah, behind the scenes is important as well, and and Nicole can teach you, teach you how to do that as well. Um, also, we want to ensure that you. Um, continue to get more information like um, what Jillian has shared with us today by following us on social media and um, just making sure that you're on our Facebook page, Instagram, um, X, if we have an X, I don't even know if we have an X or not, but um, we do, um, Melita sends out wonderful emails uh, with a lot of great information that's going on, especially with us going into session on tomorrow. Um, you know, she sends out weekly updates that are, or if something riveting happens, um, she sends that out. So please follow us on all of our social media outlets. Um, let's see, one other thing is, um, you've heard about how important this election cycle is. 2024 is a pivotal, pivotal um, election time. And so please consider renewing um, your support for Georgia Win List by going to our website as well and making a donation. And also um, for the women who are elected or trying to get elected also, just please donate to their campaigns or go knock on some doors and, and offer any kind of help that you can actually do in order to help get them um, in the house so that we can continue to fight and, and make um, these things happen that we need in our state for 2024. And I, I, I don't even want to go down that rabbit hole of, of how important 2024 is right now. So um, let's see, last thing. Um, let's see. I think that may, I 
Okay, I think that's everything on, on my to-do list. So I am going to um, give the, I think we're done. So actually don't forget, <laughs> good. So thank you again for being here. Thank you, Jillian, for sharing your expertise. We appreciate it. Please take popcorn with you. Take popcorn. <laughs>